Okay. Whoa. Oh my gosh. Wait a second. Um, all right, here you go. Hello, all. I think here you can see the screen and you see a document with very old writing on it. And with this document, I want to share with you a bit of an episode that is um, very much about, um, which is one of the big controversies involved with everything we think we know about Ivan the Fourth. So, um, before, just to recap a little bit, so far we've talked about the reign of Ivan IV. We've talked about his early reign where he did a lot of reforming things. We've talked about the Aprichtina, this bizarre episode um, where he split the realm and enacted with his henchmen, the Aprichtiniki, a reign of terror that lasted from about 1565 to 1572, um, a, a really bizarre and hard to understand episode in history that did come with a good amount of persecution, even if so many Western um, sources have exaggerated, uh, um, perhaps exaggerated the evils of Ivan as part of anti-Russian propaganda efforts that were produced during in Germanic states and in Livonia during the Livonian War, um, if you recall, one of Ivan's big foreign policy objectives was to get a foothold on the Baltic. And he was so interested in this that he was the aggressor in, the, in initiating the Livonian War, um, which lasted for decades and was ultimately unsuccessful. And Russia wouldn't get a solid permanent foothold on the Baltic until the reign of Peter the First in 1701. So it would have a long time still to go, but it was one of the foreign policy initiatives of, um, of Ivan IV. And because, and, and it was during the context of that war that his enemies, um, the Penny Press, um, produced all kinds of anti-Russian propaganda. Historians have a, have had a, um, have have had quite a task trying to sort out what's what's fiction and what's real in that in that propaganda. That said, that from from sources like the Novgorod Chronicle and some interior domestic sources, we do have we do know that Ivan engaged in this bizarre experiment of the Aprichtina, making a separate realm for himself, where um, many of the people he perceived to be enemies were. Uh, purged and executed. So one of the episodes that I didn't mention to you that happens um, before um, a, a little bit earlier is in the 15, in the 15 or during the Livonian War, the Russian, um, Russian troops uh, advanced into Livonian territory and they were, um, and at one point during the war, one of Ivan's boyars or a prince, a prince named Andrew Kerbsky, he defected from Russia over to Lithuania. And he did this in April, 1564. So a year before the Oprichina begins. Um, remember it was at, at the very end of the year, 1964 that Ivan took off without instructions. So this is coming um, within the year, but before the Oprichina starts, one of his high ranking trusted princes, Prince Kerbsky, defects to Lithuania. And he cites um, as one of his reasons, supposedly, impending repressions. And later that same year, he leads a Polish-Lithuanian army against Russia. And, and, and in that battle, Kerbsky, the, def the Russian defector, wins at a place called the Veliki Luki. As a, and, um, and as a reward, the Polish king, King Sigismund Augustus II, grants Kerbsky a village or you know, a town, um, Kavilin Valhinia, which is in what's now Ukraine, to be his. And he lived there peacefully defending his Orthodox subjects from Polish Catholic encroachments. We've talked a little bit about those religious dynamics and we'll talk more about it. Um, and, and while he was there, so Kerbsky wrote letters to Ivan and Ivan wrote back. And in these letters, 
Kerbsky said things like, I left because there were these repressions were coming and you uh, you um, behaved as a, as a bad czar and you defied what by God's will is our should be. And Ivan wrote back making these claims to divine authority and really elaborating um, and tying in his kind of um, political prerogatives with religious history. The Ivan Kerbsky um, cores correspondence is, it is a tough and convoluted read, but there are these letters that make all sorts of allusions to biblical history and other history that they would certainly have been written by an educated person. So that is the story of this, the, I, the, there's this exchange of letters between Kerbsky, this prince who defected to Lithuania, and Ivan IV that lasts from 1564 to 1579. And these letters, historians for have for a very long time used to demonstrate a number of points. One, that Ivan IV was super educated, knew the Bible, knew other history, could write well. Otherwise, you know, we wouldn't have these letters. And they've also used these letters to say, look, we have some real insight into the autocratic authority that Ivan understood himself to have. And then in the 1970s, the historian Edward Keenan came along and he published a real bombshell book saying, so much of what we think we know about Muscovy in the 16th century derives from our reading of this exchange of letters. Problem is these letters are fake. This was really a bombshell. To this day, most historians in Russia dismiss Keenan's interpretation. And the, but the problem is no one can quite um, come up with a definitive, definitive answer, a definitive solution, despite working on it quite a bit. The, the problems in understanding the text are so complicated at this point, and it would really depend on um, understanding, you know, watermarks and where paper is produced and all sorts of analysis that um, that is a bit moot because so much of what we have are copies of these supposed original letters. And here on the screen, you see um, a copy made in the 17th century of one of the first, the first letter that Prince Andrew Kerbsky sent to Ivan. And here's the rub. The evidence comes from the 17th century. And some has, even those um, quite sympathetic to Keenan, um, what they would say is that it looks to them, their interpretation, I don't know, I'm agnostic, I don't know the answer, but the, their interpretation is that these, the letters that elaborate on political philosophy, for example, and elaborate on the reasons that Kerbsky understood himself to be defected, defected, were actually thought up and composed by some sort of clerks in the Russian government in the 17th century, probably. That this correspondence didn't take place between Kerbsky and Ivan. Now, some sort of exchange of letters seems to have happened. But if it did happen, what these historians maintain is that it absolutely wasn't at the level of the letters that have come down from the 17th century. So if these letters, if this exchange is really a product of the 17th century and from the 17th century, they do exist. Um, but if that's the case, then it means we're driving a little bit more blind in terms of how we think we understand um, political political philosophy and maybe the workings of government um, during the Russian, during the reign of Ivan IV at the end of the Rurikid dynasty. So that's kind of one, one event and that I wanted to put on your radar screen. Andrew Kerbsky was a real person. He really did defect. He really did live out his days in this village that was granted to him after leading against Russia in battle. Um, but whether or not he and Ivan had this 
elaborate correspondence of many letters is a much more contested historical question. And it's one more example of why we, um, why so many questions remain and why our understanding um, is so murky and disputed about the reign of Ivan the Fourth. So with, um, with that said, the, I wanna talk now about something we do have much more of a sense of, and that is the 16th century commercial expansions that happened with the arrival of the English. And Anthony Jenkinson is one person in that big um, episode. And he is he's one, one person in that, in that episode of many English coming over. Um, and fortunately, he, he writes this, this account that we know about. So here, um, this is a timeline that you, know, you might wanna study in, in preparing for. And these are kind of big of events of the history we're talking about. We talked about Kazan last time and his foreign policy achievements, et cetera. But what's happening with the, um, in the East? Now, in the East, as you read, um, or in 1553, a number, um, three English ships that were preparing to, um, that had pooled their money and they are looking for a Northeast passage to China or Cathay, um, the, the riches of the Orient where there is all this, these textiles and valuable medicines and porcelain no less that comes out. Um, this is the age of kind of that first age of maritime European maritime exploration. They've been trying to get to the East for a long time. Vasco da Gama just got slightly scooped by Columbus who was trying to get to the East as well and, and ran into Hispaniola, an island on the edge of what became known as the New World on his way to the Indies. Um, and so there's lots of efforts. And so in 1553, this as part of that effort to get to the Far East, these Englishmen pool their money and they set off. They end up, some of the ships um, run into trouble, but one of the ships follows this course that, that you see, and it ends up at the mouth of the, of the Dvina, Dvina River in what will become, it's not there yet, it's still just like a little village, um, what will become the city of Arkhangelsk. And Richard Chancellor, who's one of the leaders, after he's, he's kind of runs into some, um, he encounters natives and Russians there, and then they escort him down to Moscow, where he, this other, um, here's Moscow over here, he gets escorted down, has to portage, and he has an audience with Ivan IV. And making the best of the conditions, he um, asks to trade, um, or he they wanna set up trade. And what they really ask for is, can we trade with you? And also, can we travel across Russia? Can we go through your lands on the way to the Indi to Indi India, no, the Indies, India, on your way to Persia, um, are, are there immediate interests and and kind of China as well? Or, but it's going to be later. It's it's really later that um, that China per se becomes central in what they're trying to get to. Um, and Ivan is quite open to this. He says yes, and he gives them quite generous terms um, where they will. Um, well, well they'll have, the czar will have right of first refusal for anything that they bring and they can the, um, have a kind of favored status. I won't get into the weeds, but the English, they really like that fav favored status and boy, did they wanna hold on to it, especially against the Dutch, the other big up and comers in international trade that they'll end up competing in in this part of the world. And so what happens is Richard Chancellor goes home um, and he, he, 1553, he gets to Russia, he meets Ivan, and then he goes home and with the kind of graces of the czar and permission to engage in trade there. And in 1555, the Muscovy Company is established. And this is a company that is going, a company of English men that are gonna have exclusive rights to trade in the area of Russia. It's an attempt to set up a monopoly. And also it may be, the first joint stock company in European history. This, this claim gets made and some people um, would splice it a little bit differently, but 
Um, it is important, but, but I will say, so 1555, this company gets formed, people pooling their money to kind of send off some ships, have them trade, and, and then come back and divvying up the profits. And that is one of the first times, maybe the first time, that Europeans are organizing their capital in that way. And this is going to become a model that European, the European global expansion is essentially built on the East India Company, the Dutch East India Company, the British West India Company, the Dutch West India Company are all entities that are basically formed on this sort of a model. And as the historian J Jeremy Israel showed, some of these early Muscovy Company Englishmen will go on to be involved in the formation of the, the British East India Company, for example. And then there's other, there's like the Estland Company and the Levant Company and many, many of these companies, the company model becomes a standard entity in the early modern period. And the Muscovy Company, as far as I know, is the first one. Um, so they, and what, what I say is, you know, they went for, they went for the uh, riches of the East and they stayed for the forest products. What happens is, the English and the British start training, trading a whole bunch. And what are the English getting from Russia? The English, what they're getting from Russia are products like, um, are forest products like tar and pitch and potash. These are products that when you, you um, uh, burn down trees and get the ash and treat them in certain ways with the pitch from burned trees. And you use this to paint the bottoms of wooden boats. Um, so again, it's one of those products, we've talked about this a little bit now, like pitch matters very little to us. But if you are in the 16th and 17th century and wanna have a Navy, say one that's gonna try and go against the Spanish Armada in 1588 and you know just get lucky because of the weather, but boy, is it gonna mark kind of the rise to becoming an empire in which the sun didn't set. Those products with which you waterproofed the bottoms of your ships is super important. Similarly, tall trees and masts from the forests of northern Muscovy, um, some of that also happens. And the English will also get a lot of hemp products and the, um, the plants that from which are made rope and sail um, are going to, the British Muscovy will become a big source for this, even such that pretty early on, the English will set over Set over, send over Englishmen who will set up a rope rope works factories in northern Russia. So they're actually in Russia producing these maritime products, which are super important to their maritime um, endeavors. And so, in some ways, we we think of in centuries to come, the British Navy will be non-pareil. It very much depended on those um, less glamorous products from Muscovy, like to make it sail and its rope and the pitch to secure the bottom of its boats to say nothing of masts. So this, this in 1555, this is the beginning of that English relationship. That English relationship, that Russo-English relationship is by no means untroubled. And um, I won't, I, I'm kind of going to keep my comments brief here, but one of the um, so here, just as repeating what I already told you, they're, they're looking for um, kind of a North Eurasian route and they get a North Sea route to Moscow. Richard Chancellor sets it up and they are, um, so what are some of the problems that uh, accompanied this relationship? Well, the Dutch. The Dutch are also quite aggressive um, traders and they will come into the mix when we read about Ivan Massa, he is, is from the Dutch end of things. He, he is the, uh, the primary source that we're gonna read next. We're gonna read about Ivan, Ivan Massa's history. Um, so he's on the Dutch side of things. And in the, um, from the 1580s, 90s, when the Dutch are getting there, they're really beating it, um, kind of duking it out with the English for, the best trade with Russians. Uh, I'll, I'll kind of leave it at that and, and um, stop there. 
enter Anth Anth Anthony Jenkinson, whom we've re read about. So Anthony Jenkinson is one, is an agent or a factor of the Muscovy Company. And he travels to Russia on behalf of the Muscovy Company um, a number of times. Now, as from the very get-go, the, well, let me actually kind of come back to this. The Muscovy Company is initially interested in getting into in gaining access to the riches of the East. It is interested in Muscovy only for transit purposes. Although it turns out that those um, kind of less glamorous forest products end up being super important for England and the, the basis of a robust trading relationship um, that's gonna be really strong in the 15th century, gonna fall off quite a bit in the seven, um, sorry, really strong in the 16th century. It's gonna fall off quite a bit in the 17th century. And, but then by the end of the 18th century, it is going will again be Russia's um, most major, um, Russia's most major trading partner. That's a much later story that actually I'll just put up here because I recently reviewed it that I um, wrote about in this book, Enterprising, Enterprising Empires, Russia and Britain in 18th century Eurasia. That's just kind of to point to this longer history, but back to kind of the second half of the 16th century. Um, so they want to, they're developing all this, these relationships and they're getting these forest products, but they're very interested in moving through Russia to get to Persia, to get to India, to get to China and trade with the products there. And so one of the things they're trying to do is secure permission to transit. Anthony Jenkinson gets that permission. And he, um, and so in his travels, which you've read about, and we'll talk about, he, that's why he, he goes to Moscow, talks about that, but then he moves on. He goes down the Volga River, which as, you, as, we, do, as we know, Moscow has just barely started to secure control of because it conquered Kazan in 1552 and then Astrakhan in 1556, but this is steppe land. So as, you, as you've seen in his account, it's not as if one can be assured of secure travel and be unmolested by um, roving nomads to travel along the Volga in the 16th century. But what Jenkinson is up to is to um, leave Moscow, travel along the, Mus um, the Oka and then Volga rivers, come down here into the Caspian and then make his way on to uh, the cities of Central Asia where he is going to suss out trade opportunities. You know, what, what are the prospects? How should and how should we go about trying to make inroads into these markets and investing? That's sort of the reconnaissance work that his, his mission, missions are about. He, um, he is famous for having gotten on quite well with Ivan. Ivan seems to have liked him must have been a charismatic individual. Um, but and another consequence of his trip is that he produces one, an earl, very early map of Muscovy. I will, I put this up here, I put this up now because I'll show you some more maps as we go along. And I'll just um, point out this one other picture, picture here is, this is a picture of Ivan. And again, this is a 19th century painting, nowhere near the 16th century, but the, um, the interiors are probably pretty close to the material culture. Um, but here is a painting of Ivan showing Jerome Horsey his treasury. Jerome Horsey is another one of, um, Jerome Horsey is another agent for the Muscovy companies who between the years 1573 and 1591 um, spends quite a bit of time in Muscovy. So arriving after the chaos of the Oprishna and working on building, um, building trade relationships. The, um, oh, this is just another map that I didn't show. The Barents Sea, so a little bit of geography. This up here is called the Barents Sea and it's named after Wilhelm Barents, who is in the 1590s part of um, exploratory efforts to better understand this far northern coast. And here are um, maps produced after a journey in 1594 and 1596. Again, much of that is better left to stuff when we talk about mapping and better understanding this coast and this world. Um, 
the one of the main points I want to just put on your radar screen is the opening up of really direct and active commercial relations between Russia and Western Europe. For as long as anyone's been, anyone knows, trade products have been moving overland through the Polish, Polish and Lithuanian lands, um, as well as through the South. But that those goods were often kind of, Russians would hand them off to you know, Belarusians, to Germans, to other people, as opposed to traveling all the way to Hamburg directly. As, as far as we know, very little is, is documented about this early trade. But now with, the, with Richard Chancellor and the founding of the Muscovy Company, now Russia is directly trading with the English and will continue to um, with a brief hiatus of 12 years when Charles I gets executed. Um, Russians didn't like that, they oust him. Um, but there's some other things going on as well. But pretty much it is the start of a long and continuous trading relationship that continues into this day. Now, one other thing that I'll just kind of um, wet your whistle with but not develop is that it is in the 1580s. So just a couple decades after this happens or um, that Russians start expanding in identifiable appreciable ways eastward into Siberia. Um, so we'll, and we'll talk about that. The Stroganovs in the 1570s are granted charters and then with the um, 15, in the early 1580 or 81, the actual conquest of Siberia is gonna start with Yermak. And one of the things I always kind of like to think about is would the Russians have been moving in that direction on their own? Or do was it maybe in some ways all the, this interest in the West in passing through Russia to get farther on to these Eastern Southern lands that somehow played some role in in Muscovite moves to advance eastward. And maybe that's a question that we can talk more about when we talk about the um, founding or the when we talk about the conquest and expansion into Siberia. Um, and with that, I will turn off the recording and we can start talking about Anthony Jenkinson.